Hi everybody, welcome back to First Chapter Friday. Um, this month we're going to be reading a book by Tay Keller called Jennifer Chan is Not Alone. Now Tay Keller is actually a Newbery Medal winner for her book um, When You Trap a Tiger, but that's actually not the reason I picked this one. I picked this one this month because man it throws you right into the storyline and I like books that do that. So let's just go ahead and get started. We'll see if you get hooked as quickly as I did. Again, it's by Tay Keller called Jennifer Chan is Not Alone. Okay, chapter one, now. Okay, the end of everything starts with a buzz. You know the one, the insecty buzz that makes your heart beat faster, that tells you that someone wants your attention. So maybe I should say that the end of everything starts with a text, but we'll get into that in just a minute because right now I'm here sitting between Tess and Reagan in our school's chapel. My thighs sweat slipping against the wooden seat, shirt sticking to my back. The overhead fans are spinning, but they're not nearly enough for a small town Florida heat even in October. Reagan fans herself with the concert programs and mimes falling asleep. She even lets out a fake little snore. Tess muffles her laugh and I make my eyes wide at them. Eyes that say, pay attention or we'll get in trouble. But also, you're so right. I am so bored out of my mind. I can say a lot without a word which comes in handy during these orchestra evenings. And let's be honest, Reagan can be a bit dramatic, but she's not entirely wrong. We come to these concerts because Tess's sister is in the orchestra. And we can't make Tess come by herself. But the problem with the Gibbons Academy Middle School Orchestra is that instead of learning new music, they play the same old Christmas carols all year every year by the millionth rendition of Silent Night. It's kind of a lot. Secretly though, I think there's something comforting about the strings and the familiarity. And today, especially, I welcome the sameness. Today, I'm locked in a battle with my brain, thinking about the incident from Friday. While also really, not really thinking about it, not really thinking about it. Not really not thinking about it. My mind keeps drifting, floating to that feeling of my whole self just coming apart. And then I have to drag my thoughts right back into this very normal, very boring evening. See, silent night, just like it always is. And that's when Reagan's phone buzzes, the text that ends everything. But I don't know yet that it's an end everything text. The orchestra begins, hark the herald angels sing, and I watch Reagan pull her phone out of her pocket. For a split second, she frowns at the name on the screen, and then she rearranges her face like she realized her reaction was wrong, and she smiles, and she raises her brows until they disappear beneath her dark brown bags. Bangs, her blue eyes spark. These are the kind of eyes that say, I have a secret. It's Pete, she mouths. With a rush of relief, I send a thank you up to the universe. This is the perfect distraction. Unlike the incident, Reagan's drama with Pete is predictable and constant. It's as familiar as this Christmas carol. Seriously? Tess whispers too loudly. From, a, from the pew in front of us, a random dad shushes her, shh, and Reagan rolls her eyes before dropping her gaze to Pete's text. As she reads, her shoulders stiffen, and she doesn't say anything. She doesn't move, but her eyes flick back and forth and back and forth over the screen like she's reading the text again and again, and I try to look over her, or I try to look over her shoulder, but then she tilts the phone away from me. Too late, I realized my mistake. That tiny movement, that flick of a hidden screen, signals to Tess that this might be a particularly interesting flavor of gossip. And now, she'll never let it go. What's it say? asked Tess. Um, Mike, you have to tell us. 
Something to know about Tess. Every sentence that leaves her mouth ends with a question mark. Even when she's making a statement, it sounds like a question. She leans over me to get closer to Reagan. I try to nudge her away. Tess is all long legs and long arms and thin and sharp. Right now, her elbow digs into my stomach and her red-orange curls stick to my lip gloss. Tess, I say stop. I'm distracted, so it takes me a moment to notice Reagan's reaction. And she sucks on her lips and her skin goes so pale that the freckles sprinkled across her cheeks look like bold flecks of paint. This is an expression I've only seen once before. Only one time in over a year of best friendship, Reagan's scared. My heartbeat leaps into my ears and I can and I tell it to stop being so dramatic. Maybe you should put your phone away, I tell Reagan. I can't deny that I'm curious, but after last week, I'm in the mood for anything. Um, I'm not in the mood for anything intense. Um, maybe don't put your phone away, Tess says, because you have to tell us what's going on. The dad turns to shush us for the second time, but Reagan ignores everyone. She taps back and forth and back and forth with Pete until finally she looks up. <gasps> there are police cars outside Jennifer's house, she whispers. Definitely not normal. No, I say. At least... I think I say it because I hear myself speak, but I don't actually register saying the word. I grasp for reasonable explanations. Do you think the police were just stopping by? Or maybe, do you think? Jennifer told the police what we did, Tess interrupts. Like, are they coming for us? I wish Tess would give this just a minute. I wish she would wait one second before jumping to conclusions. I can't process. My right leg starts shaking and my heart beats so loud that I can't even... No, no, this doesn't make sense. We can't go to jail for the incident. I mean, it wasn't great. It's not my favorite thing to think about, but it wasn't that bad. It wasn't illegal. Don't be stupid, Reagan says, and I can't help but flinch at the way she says the word, her consonants hard and harsh. Stupid. The police aren't there for us. So what's, Tess starts, but Reagan's phone buzzes again. She stares at the screen and she whispers to us, Pete's not supposed to know this, but he heard it from his dad. Pete's dad is the county sheriff, so Pete's always finding out more than he should know. Reagan swallows. <sighs> Jennifer is missing. I let the words settle over me, thick and icy. The heat and humidity can't touch me anymore. She's missing, I repeat. I try to make sense of this, but it's all so weird. Nothing ever, ever happens in this town. Nothing ever happens in Nowhereville. Reagan looks at me and beneath the stone in her expression, there is a desperation that only I can see. Her eyes say, I need you. Jennifer left a note that said she's like running away. She ran away? Uh, apparently I'm only capable of repeating Reagan's words now. Leaning over, Tess asks, did she say why? Reagan blinks like she forgot Tess was even there. But I have to admit, I'm glad Tess asked the question. I need to know too. Reagan shakes her head. Not sure. Pete's dad wouldn't show him the note. Maybe it's not fair, but suddenly I'm red hot mad at Pete. I hate him. Seriously. Why would he tell Reagan something like this if he didn't know the whole story? Why would he tell her without a crucial bit of information? Oh my gosh, Tess says. Do you think this is like Jennifer's revenge? Oh my goodness, that thought makes me woozy. Like, do you think Jennifer's trying to get back at us? Tess pushes. Trying to get us in trouble? Her questions bulldoze any last shred of calm, any scrap of normalcy. 
I feel my intestines are disintegrating. The energy in the chapel shifts and I notice the whispers. It's almost like Jennifer's news is a physical thing. I can see it move through the chapel. We find out first, then Kyle, Pete's best friend, checks his phone and whispers to one of his friends. Kyle texts someone and then his girlfriend of two days gets a ping and gasps and then all sorts of girls are whispering. I watch the news ripple through the students. Not all of us are here this evening, but enough. Before the end of the night, nearly everyone will know. The news moves in waves of popularity through the pews with some kids turning back to Reagan and me, almost like they want to know how to act. Under their gaze, I feel itchy, shaky, like I've no control of my own body. Too quickly, the news reaches the parents and they murmur among themselves. News spreads fast in Nowhereville. That is something to know. I hear her name whispered softly at first and then loudly, Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. She's impossible to escape. She's everywhere. She's not here. A parent runs up and says something to the conductor who cuts the music. Phones ring and people talk. The world, the whole world is too loud. And I hear it over and over. Jennifer Chan ran away. Jennifer Chan is missing. The end of everything starts quietly with a buzz you can barely hear. But it doesn't end that way, not even close. And that is the end of uh, chapter one of Jennifer Chan is Not Alone. I cannot wait to continue with this, so I hope you guys do too. Um, but that's the end of the first chapter. And this book right now is only available in paper form. So if you like it, you will have to... Um, Either come in, check out the book, or put a hold on it in um, the catalog. Okay? Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Have a great month, and I'll see you soon. Okay? Bye!